the country was at war uh, since the early 1960s until 2002, and only with the death of the rebel leader, John Savimbi, and the defeat of the rebels did that war come to an end. Um, so what you saw immediately afterwards was a growth without precedent between 2002 and 2014, um, and the Angolan economy grew tenfold, uh, and it became the third largest economy in sub-Saharan Africa, more or less the size of the whole of East Africa put together. Um, on the other, so that's obviously quite a momentous development. On the other hand, a lot of the prosperity that was generated um, by this uh, economic miracle, you could call it that, um, did not really benefit the vast majority of the population. The role of China has to be seen in the context of broader dynamics of post-war reconstruction in Angola. It's not the only reason that allowed Angola to uh, proceed in the way that the book explains, in this spectacular, if, if flawed and very fragile, process of national reconstruction. Um, there's at least two other factors that allow that to happen um, just as much. One of them is obviously the end of the war itself, uh, the fact that it was a military victory on the government side rather than a power-sharing compromise meant that the government could define the nature of the peace in, in its own way. And the second and perhaps even more important factor was the fact that the price of oil went from $22 a barrel when the war ended in 2002 to $147 a barrel only six years later in 2008. So there was a lot of money around and the, the victorious regime could do as it saw fit. But there's a third factor, and I think that's where China really comes in. China um, was in the midst of a Africa offensive, uh, a return to Africa, uh, if you will, um, without parallel since the 1960s, when China was briefly a major presence on the continent. But China, because of the Cultural Revolution and a series of uh, phenomena having to do with Chinese internal politics, China sort of didn't disappear completely, but became far, far less important. And then in the early 2000s, China really returned to, to Africa with a vengeance. In that context, Angola became the most important of China's African partners. Um, and it was a mutually beneficial relationship, at least initially. For the first 10 years of this new China-Angola relationship, the Angolans, um, because of the nature of their regime being quite centralized around the president and quite shrewd, quite strategic about international relations, um, the Angolans were able to strike a relationship with China that was very balanced uh, and quite, uh, quite unusually so. Um, and they were able to extract from China at least as much as China was able to extract from Angola, if not more. Um, over the last two years, that relationship started to change. Uh, partly because the amazing oil prices that uh, existed between 2002, 3 and 2014, with a few um, drops in 2008, 2009, except for those drops, the price remained very, very high for, for those 10 years. But over the last two years, the price of oil has practically collapsed. And for a country that is unusually oil dependent, Angola is one of the most oil dependent countries in the world, uh, with more than 95% of the country's exports being just oil. You can imagine what that did to the Angolan miracle, to the Angolan growth story. It's completely sort of stopped it in its tracks. But from the point of view of the Angolan-Chinese relationship, it also um, allowed China to demand much more. The Chinese realized that suddenly the tables had turned, that this African state they used to have a quasi-symmetrical relationship with was actually quite indebted, um, was entering uh, a very difficult moment, and the Chinese have been asserting their dominance in this bilateral relationship over the last year and a half especially. So the relationship is very dynamic and is currently, to my mind, changing in favor of China. There is nothing wrong with what the government says. The government talks about national development, it talks about the need for diversification of the economy away from oil, and especially the need for industrialization. These are all goals that we can agree with. The problem is that they haven't been pursued by the government. Uh, over the last 12 years, they've talked the talk, but in effect, they were more than happy to have essentially a rentier, oil-dependent economy. A lot of wealthy people put their money abroad and did well for themselves, but didn't really pursue national development however defined. It seems that now the country is reeling under the current crisis, and some influential voices are coming out talking about uh, industrialization, about diversification, and it sounds more real. 
it sounds that there may be some political willingness uh, to take this forward. But the challenges are momentous. One remains an optimist about um, the near future, um, but I think things in Angola are certainly going to get worse before they get better.